Hey, movie retrospective. Let's see, what did the Patreon <laughs> patrons choose on the poll this week? Stephen King adaptation from yeah. 1984, Children of the Corn. Yeah, not a bad flick. I remember it. Outlander. Remember it? We saw it again, and I was just like, yeah, okay, I remember this shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, the interesting thing about this movie is that I think I probably saw this. Let's see, shit. It came out in 1984. Uh, when I was 12 years old. I don't think I saw it in the theater, but I saw it on cable, like, as soon as it came out on cable. So I saw it when I was, like, a preteen or, like, an early teenager. And I remember really digging it. I saw it probably, like, hundreds of times because I think I taped it off cable or whatever and watched it a bunch of times. But then I didn't watch it again for many years and then just recently watched it again. And it's still okay, but... It doesn't, I think it doesn't hold up as well as an adult. I think it's more like, it works out better if you're a kid, because I think you can relate to the kid characters better. Well, also, it was a movie of its time. Well, that so too. So back in those days, it was, it was a lot more exciting. It's not a bad movie. It, it's, the, yeah, it's not even like one of the worst. I mean, Stephen King kind of has a reputation for some of his like adaptations being bad, but it's yeah. like, this, this would be like mid-tier, yeah, I think. Yeah, upper mid. Yeah. Upper mid, actually. You know, it's not as good as Christine or The Dead Zone, but, you know, it's not as bad as Maximum Overdrive and some of that other fucking or crazy. Sleepwalkers. Or Sleepwalkers. Yeah, or fucking... Or the Langoliers. Langoliers, you know, you're not, you're not talking <laughs> about that, you know. It's um, kind of akin to watching a good Dead Mall video. It does show a bunch of older interiors and fucking, you know what I mean, some retro... Uh, uh, early 1900s, maybe like 1920s, 1930s, deserted towns. You know, it has some pretty cool shots of that. It did kind of take me back. And the clothes and, uh, you know, um, had old what's-her-name when she was a baby. Linda Hamilton. Linda, Linda Hamilton is a baby. Yeah, she wasn't quite a baby. This came out the same year as Terminator, although I think she might have shot it because I think Terminator came out later in she the year. She looked a little bit younger. So in I'm this. assuming that I mean she had better hair in this yeah. for sure because that was kind of like Yeah. I I think I read the book but I didn't I don't recall being that impressed with the it's book. It's a real short story. It's not even a book. book it's a short story. It's a really then short story. Then I must story. have read it because I read a lot of his short It was story. in Night Shift. Yeah, I read that one. So I, I, yeah, I, I had Night Shift. Yeah. I, I still my, have it. Yeah. So I, I did read it. I just didn't remember that much about it. The movie it's shot in a way that was very familiar to our generation. It's very um, coherent. There's nothing stylistic about it or anything. It's very point A to point B. It's just a straightforward, almost generic kind of production. But that might be a good thing. You know what I mean? It's it's it's, it's it, TV movie like. Yeah. Which yeah. isn't necessarily a bad thing because they made a lot of t good TV movies yeah. and a lot of good TV like Stephen King adaptations like Salem Lot, Salem's Lot, for example. Yeah, but you know, Salem's Lot. But you know, there was nothing like stylistically that like no stuck style. out no. about this movie. No. It was very workmanlike. Exactly, let's, let's that's a good that. way of putting it. Yeah. yeah, which which you know, that kind of that kind of that kind of holds up over time in a certain way. Yeah, because the movie's very coherent. And it's a very linear storytelling. Well, it's a very so, simple story. Very simple. They don't really need to yeah. do anything fancy with it, even though they changed it a lot from the short story. Because yeah. like I said, the short story, I think, was first published in 1977, I want to say. I think it was in Penthouse or something like that. Because a yeah. lot of his early short stories can turn up in skin mags. Yeah. Um, but then it was like, you know, anthologized later when Night Shift came out. And the story is like super, super short. Yeah. So obviously they had to add a bunch of shit like to the movie. And I guess Stephen King wrote the original screenplay for this, but the producer did not like it, which because he's the producer said, "Look, dude, the first thirty-five pages of your screenplay is just your two protagonists, the couple, like arguing with one another in the car." And yeah. it's like when not, and it's funny because the producer, I don't know exactly what he said to Stephen King, but he said like stuff that I've said about Stephen King in the past. It's like, dude. Uh, film is a visual medium. Yeah. Um, stuff that works in a short story, like, you know, doesn't necessarily work in a filmic kind of, uh, you know, context. Yeah. So um, it's like, yeah, we don't we don't want half an hour of like two people just bickering at one another in the car. Yeah. So we need like some other way to approach this. So they had to add a bunch of stuff from the story because in the short story, which, like I said, is only a few pages long. 
Yeah. Maybe four pages, if I remember correctly. Basically, all that happens, and this is spoiler alerts, like for a 1977 short story and a 1984 movie, obviously, so don't get upset at me. But, you know, basically in the story, uh, the couple who, who are named Bert and Vicky, um, they're going, they're actually driving across country to go to marriage counseling or something like that. I don't know why they couldn't find marriage counseling where they lived, but whatever. Uh, so, and they basically can't stand each other. So they're just like arguing and arguing the whole time. But um, they, you know, they hit a kid. They end up having to go to this little bitty town called Gatlin. And um, basically all the kids there who have got religion uh, end up killing them. They, they both die. Uh, so, <laughs> which does not happen in the movie. But the interesting thing too is that in the short story, it's been a way longer time since the kids killed the adults. I think it's been 12 years. Whereas in the yeah. movie, it was only four years or three or four years. Um, so like in the story, um, they're already on the second generation because they're already having kids. Like the little, the teenagers are, are were already having kids. Yeah. And it's kind of, it's kind of like Logan's run with carousel. You can't make it to 19 to kill you. They sacrifice you. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's essentially. Which I forgot that element, but yeah. And that's so, like from the short story too, because, yeah. and like I said, in the short story, since it's been such a long time, um, the characters of Isaac and Malachi are mentioned, but I don't even think Isaac was born like when, because I think he was a second generation person in the story. So he wasn't even born, like, because in the movie, he's kind of like the mastermind behind the massacre of the adults, but he wasn't even born in the story. And he's not really like a big character in the story either. I thought they did a good job, though, of representing this individual medium. I mean, they show the little fucking temple, the little churches with the fucking evil fucking Jesus, the corn Jesus. and the, That corn Jesus fucking, is pretty creepy. The, I holy, the, the so-called unholy fucking paintings of fucking gorillas coming out. Fucking people. <laughs> shit, that kid, shit that little kids would do, you know. I liked that. I mean, like you said earlier, you if, if a movie is dialogue based, I check out. I think that's a failure of cinema to have that. Uh, uh, like a movie is actually just glorified comic book strip. And what's the movies I tended to like started out as a big old storyboard, and that's really you know because it's a visual medium. Uh, like a good example. All right, Conan, Conan books. They tried to do a real accurate, this is recently, I saw a review on it. They tried to do a real accurate, illustrated version of a Conan novel. It failed because it's mostly talking. And that makes a really fucking boring comic book. Marvel's version of, the, of it, the comic book version of it from the 70s and the 80s is exciting. It was nothing but Conan running around fighting monsters and chopping people's heads off. And that was a very successful comic book. It's a different medium. If, for me, film and cinema, it's like a comic strip. It's got you got to show a lot of shit, and this movie kind of, this movie did that. It did that. It, it keeps you in the story, and, and and every there was always constantly something happening. It had suspense, although it did seem to take. It did seem like they were driving around for a long time before they actually. Got, yeah. And I'm like, how many days has passed? They're still driving. <laughs> They're still driving around. They still can't get into the town. It seemed one, like a couple days had passed. Well, the way one it was thing added. that I had forgotten about, like, because I've, because like I said, I saw this movie a million times when I was a teenager, but I hadn't seen it for probably like at least 20 years. One aspect that I had forgotten about was that in the movie, and this is not from the, this uh, is, is a film original. In the movie, it almost seemed like the, you know, he who walks behind the rose was like making it so that, that, so that they couldn't get out of the town. Yeah. But I don't know if that was like supernatural or if it was because, because they made a couple comments like that the signs were like pointing different ways, like Gatlin this way, Gatlin this way, like yeah, a mile later. So I don't know if the kids rearranged right. them to keep people away or keep people in there. Right. There's like some shit in here that doesn't really make a whole bunch of sense. Well, there has to be some explanation of how the kids could be on, be in there on their own for for such a for such a long, long time without time anybody without checking in on and, them. Yeah, I'm wondering what happened to the to to, to their everybody. relatives and stuff. So there had and then just regular strangers showing up and delivery people and maintenance people and yeah. people bringing fuel and people fixing power lines, you know. Eventually they would find out that someone there were no, would notice that there was no <laughs> even in a pre-internet era. Yeah, they would find out that the town didn't have any adults in it. So there had to be some kind of an ex. I think it was a mixture of both. I think it was there's supernatural forces, demonic forces were keeping people out, and 
and also the kids were fucking ordered to do shit like rearrange signs and stuff by the this demonic yeah. being. Because I feel like nobody, like nobody had come through there in like all this. But I, I kind of been, maybe I'm like overthinking this. Maybe this is my, like my writer brain. I'm kind of justifying it by saying, well, he who walks behind the rose every now and then, they need like another sacrifice, like an extra sacrifice of some quote unquote outlanders. So at that stage, he'll kind of like rearrange shit to make it so that a car will come by yeah. and get lost and they won't be able to get to the next town, uh, which I think was Hemingford. Yeah, but even back in those days, missing people fucking, they would have tracked down where they went missing. Yeah. But it's a movie. I'm they had a that. psychic girl that could tell them when people were coming. Yeah. So maybe the the demonic force that was running the show also knew who they could kill and no questions would be asked. Yeah. I mean, like you know, but uh, you're reading into it too much. Well, that's what the I'm saying. But that's what time, I that's what I do. Though. Yeah. The thinking of the time, <laughs> the thinking of the time is that it was just a fucking movie and they're telling you a tale. You weren't supposed to read too much into it. And then you're dealing with Stephen King and that motherfucker was on so much coke and drinking so much. He just well, he's especially just, in the eighties. He was just sure. pulling shit out of his ass. You know, it was they were good stories though. I actually, yeah. I actually liked this story, and um, I think when I first saw the movie, I think I saw the movie before I read the story, and then when I read the story, I was like really surprised because it's really different. Like I said, the whole dynamic between Bert and Vicky in the short story is completely different. Like they can, they're already married, they've been married a long time, and they completely loathe each other. And in the movie, they're like, I, they're, I don't think they're married yet, and they're like real lovey dovey. I mean, I guess they had to do that to make it so like it would be more. Um, you know, emotionally affecting when she gets kidnapped by the killer kids and then gets put up on the fucking, you know, corn crucifix or whatever across from the blue man. Um, in the story, uh, Vicky gets killed and, like, she gets crucified and then they, like, tear her eyeballs out and, like, put fucking corn husks in the eyeballs and everything. And he, ba I think he sees it and he's basically like, meh. But then he gets killed too. Right. So <laughs> by he who walks behind the rose. So basically the story, if you haven't seen it, and the weird thing about it is that Children of the Corn, even though it's not, I mean, it's an okay movie. It's not a fantastic movie, but it's funny how ingrained it's become in pop culture, like even nowadays. Because I mean, if you see, well, like I've seen shit on like South Park. I've seen shit about like where people would be like Outlander and like everybody yeah. knows about like fucking Isaac and Malachi and all that kind of shit. And, you know, if you say children of the corn, people know exactly what you mean. It's just like all these little rube children, like, living out in the middle of Nebraska or wherever. And it's like, you know, you, you go through the town and they fucking kill all the adults. So everybody knows about that. And did you know, I did not know until today. I knew there had been a sequel, which I think was called The Final Sacrifice, um, which I think I might have seen. Because I read the Wikipedia thing and I'm like, that sounds vaguely familiar. So I might have seen that on cable at some point. Do you know there are ten... Of these fucking movies. The, Ten of them. Yeah. yeah. And actually. It's terrible. You never hear them. Well, they're not like, there's not like any narrative continuity. It's kind mm. of like a thing where they just kind of take the premise of like the killer kids, like out in the middle of it. And then they kind of like have, you know, kind of standalone stories about people that lived in the town or once lived in the town and left and then came back and they have shit like that. And also Sci-Fi Channel did a remake of it in 2009, which I had no idea about, which I heard was a little bit closer to the story and it was like passable. It was fine. And I heard that they were doing another remake of it, like that's supposed to be coming out next year. Mm. But I don't, you know, I don't know how that's going to go. But like I said, um, this is basically... The story is there's this little town four years ago, all the kids like got religion. Isaac was the main guy played by John Franklin, who he, um, he's great in this, but the thing about it is that he's supposed to be a kid and he kind of looks like a kid, but when he shot this, I think he was 25, but he had some kind of, um, he has some kind of growth hormone, like an illness that made him childlike. Hmm. Um, so I think that was one of the, reasons they wanted him in the movie because there's something kind of like unsettling about him i guess because he's like an adult but he's like a kid at the same time but yeah. that's why because he had that kind of like uh malady he also turned up in one of the sequels maybe the fifth or the sixth one which i think was isaac's return or isaac's revenge or something like that but he wasn't in some of the other ones and i think he actually like maybe had written the um the screenplay for that or co-written the screenplay but um, so basically he's like the, the mastermind. Malachi is kind of like his muscle, I guess, is like he's his second in command, the one that goes out and does all the dirty work. Whereas Isaac is kind of the one that it's like, you know, he who walks behind the rose and he talks to me and he tells me what to do and shit. So they've basically got this weird pagan corn based religion, which 
um, is some kind of demon apparently telling them it's it's a folk religion like a harvest kind of we need like to you know put blood in the earth and then it makes the corn grow and that's what they use everything for like they use the corn for everything so it's kind of like this weird kind of pagan kind of shit that they're doing but the thing about it though is like you can tell that the movie and the short story to an extent also they're kind of talking about like you know, the dangers of, like, fundamentalist religion and everything like that. But you kind of undermine your message a little bit because he who walks behind the rose in the movie is real. I mean, (laughs) you see him at the end. It looks terrible. It's a terrible special effect, um, even for the time. But it's... But it, but it's like, so it's kind of hard to be like, hey, you kids are so dumb. It's like with this dumb religion. But I'm like, well, the demon's real, though. I mean, it's, yeah, it's working. <laughs> but I also detected what it was is that you're kind of dumb if you listen to fucking mysterious demonic forces out in the damn That's corn. true. Yeah, you could you you're, you're dumb if you listen way. to some shit like that. Because remember, uh, some shit had happened in the movie before they got there. The, 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 the Mr. Coppice man, what did he call him? Ossifer, Ossifer, what's his name? The, 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 the <laughs> yeah, cop. the kids called him Ossifer. Yeah, the cop figured out what the hell was going on and was trying to use a religious rite out of the Bible to, to destroy the demon, but he got killed. He got killed before he yeah. was able to complete it. So some people had tried to prevent it beforehand or were onto it. So these people showing up in the town weren't the first ones that tried to combat this thing, which I kind of liked that element. Yeah, because that... there was that... a hero before who had fallen and yeah. you don't know anything about him. He was the cop. Yeah. The cop tried to stop it. I and the, and then cool. they like they ended up crucifying him and sacrificing him. Yeah. So cuz he's still there cuz when Vicky gets crucified, crucified yeah. he gets like But the yeah. thing about it is that they call him even though Job, one of the main kid characters who was was not in the story, they added uh, Job and Sarah those two kid characters just so you could have a perspective on the town like before yeah. Bert, Bert and Vicky got there, you know what I mean? So yeah. they wanted somebody that already lived there that was like rebelling against the shit. So they could have somebody to work yeah. together with the protagonist. So it's like, the, it's it's weird that he knew the officer's name. I can't remember what the officer's name was. Officer yeah. Hawkins or something like that. Yeah. But um, it made more sense in the story because they in the movie they called him the Blue Man. But it made more sense in the, st- in the story for them to call him the Blue Man because they wouldn't have known that that was a cop because some of yeah. them were so young that they didn't remember like who that was or what that uniform was. Yeah. You know what I mean? Cause they just grown up there. Yeah. So the fact that like, so I think that was kind of a plot hole that they maybe should have carried over, but maybe, yeah. maybe in the movie they thought, well, 12 years, like that's a really long time. And yeah. like for nobody to notice that like these kids are running around amok. Stephen King, if you read all his works, he's not anti, he's not anti-religion or anti-supernatural, supernatural shit happens all the time in his books and it's real what he what he was talking about in the story and then what he talks about in a lot of stories that is, is that you shouldn't listen to fucking demonic and false type gods they're real but they're bad yeah and that and, and so the movie kind of holds true to kind of like the entirety of I don't remember the, the short story that well that well I remember just a, just I remember that I read it yeah I don't remember many details about it um but it, it goes along a, a Stephen King type theme, which is in a way a lot like Lovecraft, because he was you yeah. Know, Lovecraft would say the same thing, like, "Oh yeah, you're dumb for following an evil god. Yeah, evil gods exist. Yeah, they fuck you over." Because remember the the hero of the story, the protagonist, he said he 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 was like, "You guys should know better. You killed your own parents, and you're following this evil thing." You know. Yeah. So, you know, so that, that, that message is put out there. Yeah, he's it not, because I feel like Stephen King... He's not King, saying that this is a false religion. He said this is a real religion. He does either. actually, like, yeah. a lot of his short stories do kind of, like, take pokes at, like, fundamentalist religion, for real. But I do think that yeah. he... I, I mean, from everything I know, he is a Christian, so he's yeah. not, like, so yeah. much shitting on religion as a yeah, whole. Yeah, no. From fundamentalism. What I, from what I remember, the protagonist basically said, he said... The, he, he said, "You shouldn't be following false religions. A real religion has compassion, and you know, yeah, and any stuff re, like any that. religion and without love and compassion is not a real religion. It's not a real but religion. he wasn't saying that the demon wasn't real. Yeah. That the demon had given them a false religion. That's that was, and that that kind of lines up more with the thinking of the time. And then 
the thinking of Stephen King, you know, when you read a lot of his books. I always wonder if, because he's he's real in this story as well, because they do kind of show him. I don't think he describes him like super, you know, uh, I don't remember him describing him like really uh, in detail or anything other than having like really big red eyes and shit. In this, they kind of make him look like a mushroom cloudy type thing, yeah. like just like a cloud. And like I said, this... The, the special effects in this are just yeah. so, so bad, which is kind of a shame. But now I'm kind of like interested to know if the story would have been more interesting if you didn't know if the demon was real or not, or if um, these kids were just... Not a bit. It's more interesting to know that it was real. To know that it was real. I and think like so, that it yeah. Was... That it was, it was a real monster and it was really doing shit. Yeah, because I mean, um, basically, like at the at the end of the movie, because like I said, this movie ends. This movie actually has a happy ending, um, unlike the story, which has a terribly, horribly bleak ending. Yeah. But you know, in the movie, both of them live, and the two kids who are not even in the story, they are basically implying that they're going to adopt these two kids. Mm -hmm. Like they're like, "Yay, we're going to yeah. be one big happy family. We're going to take you out of this like shithole town or well, whatever." Yeah, at the time you had to have a happy ending at the time. Yeah, because I feel like the story, like I said, they both died. She got killed. The Vicky got killed. Um, he was just like, meh, good riddance. But then he got killed too. But he who walks behind the rose killed Bert. And at the end of the story, um, he who walks behind the rose was pissed because he had to like get off his like fat demon ass and kill Bert himself instead of the kids doing it because they whiffed it. So he basically, he who walks behind the rose told um, whoever, I think Amos or whoever the fucking prophet was in the story, that it's like, okay, well now, we I used to sacrifice all you bitches at 19, now it's 18. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now the only rebel in the story, and she appears in the movie too, but not in a huge role, was the pregnant girl. Yeah. Um, she was actually, she didn't do anything in the story, but at the end of the story, she was pregnant and she was looking out saying, you know, maybe I should burn this fucking cornfield down. As I was watching it again and they and they showed the inside of the church and the way they had it all arranged, it, well, man, my stomach's growling. <laughs> now we're getting hungry. hungry. <laughs> uh, as I was as I was watching it, I was like, "Man, this is base. This is a Lovecraftian message. This is basically very similar to like the cult of Dagon." Yeah, yeah. Dagon was a was was not a he was a real god. He was a sea god. He yeah, he was evil. This is the corn god. He was a real god. Yeah, it's the evil. same kind of thing. And they had a cult, and they were doing the same. They were sacrificing. It, it was a Lovecraftian type of mess, and that that goes in line with you know. With, with with King King read he he knew everything he, about yeah he was Lovecraft. a big Lovecraft was, fan yeah and that was the angle he approached religion you know if you if you look at like the entirety of what at least of what I remember of Stephen King's work like you know, the Talisman and you know and the Shining King believed that if you believed in the religion and it was a good religion that it would work like your faith in it would say like protect you against a vampire yeah. It didn't have to be Christianity. It just had to be as a, long as you believed in it. As long as genuinely. you believed in it and you and it was good. Yeah. Then you could and you had the faith in it, then it would work. And that's that's in Which the, is in really the, the only kind of religion I can get behind. <laughs> yeah. Well it, yeah, and in the story, you know, you're saying the fundamentalism in any religion, including these cults, is all dangerous. Yeah, it's bad. Right. It, it's more about an inner your inner connection with the universal God. That's that's what and, and, and just and, be cool and, and to it's everybody, about man. compassion cool. and yeah. doing the right thing and you know not doing useless shit like human sacrifice you know that's that's what he that's what king believed in basically yeah yeah which like i said that's totally a message i can get yeah. behind but yeah like i said so so this movie uh, as I said, it's obviously not up there with Dead Zone or The Shining or Misery or like any of the or even like Green Mile or anything like that. This I would put in mid tier, like Stephen King adaptations. Not like I said, not as terrible as some of the other ones that they made. Yeah, it's not the first one you go to, but like after you've seen the good ones, you move on to this one. It's just more of it. And it's quality, I, the art, it's not as artistic. Yeah, they did do a good job inside, like the special effects for. Say like the the church and certain you know it was kind of creepy with the crucifixion. Yeah, the acting it was effective, it, but like you said earlier, it was workmanlike. Yeah, and the I will say the acting in this is a little uneven. Um, it's acting of the time. Even Linda yeah. Hamilton was a little um, yeah. not bad, but just like not. I didn't really get a sense of her character. She didn't really have a lot to work with. Um, I do feel like. 
the relationship with her and Bert was okay. Um, Bert was pissing me off because, so they hit the kid with the car, you know, the kid that's trying to escape. And that's also what happened in the story. Like he gets his throat cut, they throw him in the road and then they hit the kid. And Bert is just fucking bound and determined to like find some place to go to like report the death and everything, which, okay, good. But the, if I drive into a town in the middle of fucking Nebraska and there's nobody around, like no cars or anything like that, and then I just see a bunch of kids trying to steal my car, I'm getting the fuck out of that town. Yeah. I'm not hanging around looking for another house. So it's like Linda Hamilton's character, Vicky, is just like, can we leave now, please? And I'm just like, please listen to her. And yeah. he's just like, oh, it's a little weird around here, but nothing to be alarmed about like five minutes before she gets kidnapped. He didn't have much street <laughs> wisdom. He really did, because I was like, yeah. this is more than a little weird, dude. Wrapping the corn around his car and and he goes, like, well, just weird shit they yeah, do. Yeah, this show is some weird shit they do. Yeah. I'm like, no, it's a little I'd more be like, than I'm weird. I'm out of here. I'll call yeah, the bye, cops in the next town. Yeah, bye. Yeah, it's like, let's yeah. start. I'd walk to the next town yeah. if I had to. Fuck this shit. I'm yeah. not, like I said, he didn't see any horror movies. But so I can get that. Like, I will say the interesting thing about the two little kids who played Job and Sarah, who, like I said, were not, they did, had no equivalents in the, uh, in the story, really. They were just there as kind of like the audience you know, go to, like, into the town. So you could see what was going on in the town before the main protagonist got I there. I think that might have been an attempt by the director to um, kind of, what, what's the word, not to totally cast dispersions on every child in the town, that some children were good. I think that's what that attempt was. Yeah, because those two kids were, like, wise to from the beginning. They were right. just like, fuck this, I don't like this They didn't I don't want like it to be a condemnation of, of children, I think. Yeah, they, they didn't so, want to make it so like all the kids all were terrible. All children fucking kill your kids. <laughs> they kill, kill their parents and stuff. I think that, but you know, in a book, that's more effective. Yeah. It's more effective that, no, it, it got them all. It got all the kids. Yeah. yeah. Well, like I said, even in the story, like there was a one kid, particularly that one girl that was yeah. pregnant, but she was like young. She was only yeah, like 14, Yeah, you don't 15. want to piss off the parents though and, and the people that have children in the audience. Yeah. Because they're like, my kid wouldn't do that. My kid would be like these good kids. They had a boy and a girl in there. See, yeah, that's, yeah. That's what. That's one what, of each. Yeah, the other ones they were bad kids. So I, I know the thinking of the time. Yeah, they're trying to sell the movie. They're trying to make the movie yeah. appeal to a widest audience possible, and that's how you do it. That's how you. That's how you get out of that conundrum. Yeah. You know. But yeah, so like I said, so it was kind of a win-win. But yeah. I will say that it's inter I'm not sure if they shot this in sequence, but it seems like the two kids. Their acting was kind of, they were real annoying at the beginning, I have to say. Like, especially the one scene where they were talking to the um, the one kid. What the hell was the one kid that escaped or was trying to escape, like, through the cornfield and then got yeah. hit by Bert and Vicky's car? Um, which was actually, like, a really, I had forgotten how graphic that scene was, like, with that kid getting hit with the car. I was yeah. just like, wow, that looks really real. Um, yeah, it was a little upsetting. But, um, so, the scene with them, like, when... They're talking to him and he's like, yeah, I'm going to get the fuck out of here. And I'm, he's got his little suitcase or whatever. Because I think he's going to turn 18 or 19 soon and he doesn't want to sacrifice himself like you're supposed to. So um, <laughs> I did like Danny and the Shining. Yeah. But um, so so them go. So that scene is like seemed very awkward to me because I, th I think the thing about it is that the thing about the tone of this, particularly in the beginning, I think the kids acting got better, like as the time went on, you know what I'm saying? Like as the movie went on. So that's why I'm saying, I don't know if they shot it in sequence or not. Cause the kid got that, especially the boy, like got better at the end. That kid was in fucking monster squad too, I think like later on. But, um, but so it was kind of, it was almost kind of like the tone of it was almost like those kids. I'm not going to say they thought they were in a comedy, but it's almost like the tone of, of their performance like could have turned into a comedy at any moment. Do you get what I'm saying? You mean towards the end? Well, toward the beginning. Towards the beginning? Okay. And they seemed a little... At the end, there was comedy. I mean, the kid was trying to help and the fucking but I dude, liked is, that, dude is going, get out of here. And he's like, well... And Excuse and me. The, and, the, and, the kid, and the kid helped him, you know. Excuse me for helping yeah. your stupid ass. <laughs> uh, and I think that was I think that was another uh, thing that the director wanted to do. He wanted to show that the good kids actually were kind of being heroic and helping to fight the demon. Yeah, That's, because they made they had to live in the shit. They, and they saw it, right. like all the people Which get killed. I kind of, I kind of, for a movie, for a mainstream movie, where you're trying to make money at the box office. I kind of agree with that with that decision. That yeah, I liked them decision. more toward. I liked the kids more toward the end when they were of, like, you know, heroing yeah. up. You know, and then you're kind of going taking it back to the success of Poltergeist because the kids were helping out to fight yeah. the Poltergeist to you know to get the to get the little girl back and stuff. You know, 
So that I think they tried to go that way, which, yeah, that's how I would. I liked that. Yeah. But yeah, so like I said, what, what I was talking about, not so much the end, because like I said, I thought they got better toward the end. But almost at the beginning, I think something that bugs me, like it didn't bug me back then, but I think it bugs me now, is I didn't like the kids' narration at the beginning. You know yeah, what I'm I saying? Remember it, I don't yeah. think that they needed that. I mean, I think yeah. that you could kind of see what was going on and you didn't really need. I mean, maybe they were afraid that the audience wasn't going to be on board with it and they were just kind of like, well, we need this kid like narrating like what happened. But I don't think it needed it. Probably not, no. You know what I'm saying? Like narration. That's things that could be fixed at edit. Yeah. yeah. So I could have done without that. But like, other than that, okay. Probably fine. know there's different cuts of this movie. I, not that I ever heard, yeah. but I mean, this is the only cut I've ever seen. Um, it needs a, it needs a digital remaster, if you ask me. Yeah, it's, it's it Blu-ray. doesn't look the, all that. It looks a little good. faded and old. Yeah, now. yeah, it doesn't look like it's gotten like the treatment. Well, at yeah. least the version we watched, right. we watched the version which is on uh, Tubi, and so I don't know if that's like the most recent like upgrade or whatever. But I do feel like I mean this is like a po- uh, apparently a popular franchise because like I said they made ten of these fucking movies plus like yeah. two remakes. Uh, you know one in two thousand nine and one that they're apparently working on or is slated for next year. Um, I will say too the guy that plays uh that played Malachi Courtney Gaines. He like wildly overacts in this, but I think that that is one of the most appealing things about the movie. Like him and Isaac are just like so over the top that I think that's why if they hadn't been like that, I think maybe this movie would have been like forgotten. Also shout out because Courtney Gaines, that actor was also in the burbs. Yeah. Like he played like one of the weird, like Klopek family or whatever. We reviewed that one about a while back too. I detected for me that the, the tone of the movie, they were trying to give you as much bang for your buck as possible with a pretty limited budget and the kind of, there's, there's not very many, but not much special effects in the movie. Yeah. So they're just trying to make the movie stand out. And they're trying to make the movie exciting and scary. Just but with the actors alone. So I I think probably I'd, I'd agree with the the director's fucking, you know, direction with that. Yeah. To do that. Like you said, the movie would have been forgotten without it. Yeah. I do I feel like so. it needed some of that. It needed, it needed some pop. So that's how they yeah. were gonna make it pop. They're I mean, make, like make I it s- pop with the acting. Yeah, and I mean, like I said, Isaac, I think is the it best is thing the about top. it. It but... is over the top, but hey, it's the tone of the movie, and it the movie's been remembered. That's true. Like I said, yeah. it really like seeped into the public con. Even yeah. people that I don't even, even uh, people that haven't seen the movie or sat through the movie, if you say Children of the Corn, everybody knows exactly what you mean. Which it, look, that's something. <laughs> I recommend the movie if you've never seen it. It's a very easy watch. It's not demanding on you. It doesn't have some kind of fucking sophisticated edit or it's not real artistic. You can just watch the movie. It's very easy to follow. It is entertaining. Uh, you wonder what the hell's going to happen next. You don't really get bored with it. So, for the amount of money they spent on the movie, yeah, they did a good job. They did, yeah. I, said, yeah. I, I don't even think I don't even think they spent a million on this, if I'm remembering correctly. I can't even remember. Yeah, but like it's I said, incredible. The, I mean, the gore effects, particularly the the practical effects, like the kid getting hit by the car and shit like that, that looks really good. Yeah. The only effects that are not good are the one like he walks behind the rose at the end. It's like really, really bad, like early yeah, digital effects. Yeah, the explosions and it's like cartoonish stuff. But hey, you know what? That was just the way it was in those days. And I think that the that yeah. the cheesiness like adds to its appeal. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I can see why it's been remembered kind of fondly it's like, a movie. over the years. It's a movie and it's doing what movies did back then. <laughs> it's not trying to fucking, it's not trying to show you, it's not trying to fool you into, into like a feeling where you're observing reality. It's not like that. It's like a, it's a theatrical production in the form of cinema. 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 Yeah. What's that you, you say that's like uh cinema. It sure was a movie, or what was that quote that you I had that never, I said they should just they should just, just put on that I just put on the fucking front of every well, it's, Blu-ray it is a movie. cover. It is a movie. It's a movie. It's, it is a movie. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a difference between flicks and movies, and you know, cinema, and you know, shit. You know, also some of it's just shit. Yeah, you know, it's not shit. It's good. Yeah, and it's it's a fun watch if you're just, into like yeah. '80s movies. If you're into, yeah. and like I said, it's kind of in the middle of the Stephen King adaptations. Yeah. Not as not as good as some of the ones I like. But, you know, not even as good as Christine, which I actually think is really not underrated. even as good as Firestarter, which I like. Firestarter, I, do, as I as like Firestarter. Firestarter. Well, we need to review that one of these. Yeah. We haven't done Firestarter. Firestarter, yet, The Dead Zone. We did Dead Christine, Zone. We did Christine. Shining. 
I liked the, I liked the made for TV shining. A lot of people didn't like it. I liked it. I didn't like it. Uh, well, that's uh, that's on you. <laughs> I gotta go, man. I, I I'm fucking starving. I know his, his little tummy's crying. Yeah, All right, so uh, yeah, Children of the Corn from 1984. It's actually on Tubi right now for free if you want to watch it. I think one of the uh, later. Uh, sequels, Children of the Corn Genesis or something like, which is like the fucking eighth or ninth one or whatever. I think that's on there as well. I haven't watched it. I'm sure it's probably not that good, but if you're really into probably it, terrible. you can like watch yeah. it. I was gonna watch it today, but then I was just like, nah, never mind. I got better you things. Probably to be do. disappointed. <laughs> I got better things to do. Yeah. But yeah, so you can check it out by all means, uh, and that'll do it for this review of Children of the Corn. We will see you next time. Bye. <laughs>